The following message is brought to you by the Kantaro Institute. To learn more about the Kantaro Institute's mission to advance the Christian philosophy of life, please visit www.kantaroinstitute.org. Thank you. Good morning. It seems like people are quite asleep. I'm not sure if you had your coffee yet this morning, but I'm glad you're here early. If you, well, you've already heard me introduced as Stephen Martins. I'm a staff apologist and junior scholar. Uh, just before we do proceed, I do want to mention that we are on social media. Uh, so even though we, you know, we, we've had this great talk on media, we are on social media. And we want to make sure the truth of the gospel is proclaimed. So we do have Facebook, we do have Twitter, we do have uh, uh, Instagram, but I don't think I put that up there. But you can still follow us nonetheless if you want to get our resources, which are constantly being updated with each week as time passes by. Well, the topic today that we're touching on is reason and religion. What is the nature of reason and religion? Is there a conflict between the two? And it's, it's quite a common question. Now, I've actually written an article quite recently uh, that was dispelling the myth that there was a conflict between science and faith, and you can find that on our website. And although it's somewhat similar, it's actually quite a different question, this question about reason and religion. It doesn't quite mean the same thing as science and faith. According to Richard Dawkins, uh, who we all know wrote the best-selling book, The God Delusion, he took a position against religion because it teaches us to be satisfied with not understanding the world. Now, here's a funny fact about his best-selling book. If you were to visit a used bookstore, you'll find stacks and stacks of The God Delusion because of readers who don't want the book anymore and readers who don't want to buy the book. It's, it really has continued to be a thorn in his side as opposed to being uh, his greatest achievement. But nonetheless, it remains a position held by various secular humanists that religion seems to be antithetical or contradictory to reason, and that we're better off with an irreligious rationality. Well, it was humanist Kenneth G. Lucy who wrote for an online periodical that for the Christian responding to the problem of evil... The theist sometimes abandons reason and takes refuge in a faith that feels no need to answer the quibbles of reason, thereby dismissing any need to answer reason's arguments. Once reason has been abandoned, all argumentation becomes pointless and the discussion has moved beyond reason's reach. Bruce Smith, he's the author of The Path of Reason, a philosophy of non-belief. He also wrote about faith and reason. And he states that the the philosophical period known as the Enlightenment was a period when mankind discovered that the answers to many major philosophical questions could be found outside of religion and in reason alone. Reason had provided new answers. Believers just don't like them. Faith is overrated. When it comes to understanding the world around us, there is no need for it. Well, it's not a novel development. Back in the 1930s, a wide array of professors, some proclaiming to be atheists and others agnostic and skeptics, wrote and signed a significant document called the Humanist Manifesto. And a second revised edition was later published and signed in 1973 by various scholars and scientists. And then in the year 2000, the more recent version was published called Planetary Humanism. The theme of these three manifestos were the elaboration of a philosophy and value system that excludes belief in God and traditional religion. This came to define secular humanism as a philosophical worldview that makes mankind the ultimate norm by which truth and values are to be determined. A worldview that reveres human reason, evolution, naturalism, and secular theories of ethics while rejecting every form of supernatural religion. Religion is reduced to a social byproduct of human evolution, an unnecessary component to human life. And as Richard Dawkins says, one of the things that is wrong with religion is that it teaches us to be satisfied with answers which are not really answers at all. Well, what efforts have then been made to explain away religion? There was a great push to explain away religion as a byproduct of evolution in the 19th century, from history to theology to psychology. Various historians, ethnologists, and religious scholars sought to advance their theories for the origin of religion, Frederick Schleimacher being one of them. 
Now, Schleiermacher was a 19th century theologian who passionately argued that, th- that religion was not a set of beliefs as traditionally held, but rather a person's feelings. This was where religion began. The basis for his argument is that we all depend upon something, and universally, mankind has always held this feeling of dependence. And as a result, this feeling is expressed in terms of depending on an absolute, which is God. Now, in his attempt to explain man's universal dependence upon an absolute, which he argues is God, he fails to adequately explain the nature of God and of religion. Now, what Schleimacher has suggested is that our feelings bring us to a belief in the existence of God, but this says nothing about God, nor of those who do not believe in God. Our feelings do not determine whether there is a God or not, just as our feelings do not determine the laws of physics. Well, his theory wasn't very well received among scholars, but it was one of many that were put forward. The 19th century philosopher Ludwig Feuerbach promoted the theory that God was nothing more than the idealized traits of man. He argued that this God was merely a combination of idealized human traits such as love, justice, power, knowledge, etc. In other words, this idealized picture of humanity was turned into unlimited characteristics, projecting the image of a being with unconditional love, perfect justice, absolute power, and inexhaustible knowledge, the creation of God. But the theory is itself inconsistent. How do you determine, for example, which human traits are worthy of being idealized? Should we idealize the honest man or the man who lies? The man who shows integrity or the man who steals? How can mankind determine or justify which traits are good? And what does he mean by good? Without God as a moral standard, any attempt to justify the idealization of one trait over the other fails. The proponents of this theory could have conceded that God comes first, but then what use at all do idealized human traits serve in the origin of religion? It would rather suggest that we base idealized human traits upon the God who created us. Now, other theories emerged, such as the 19th century psychologist Sigmund Freud, who believed that God was the result of the human subconsciousness. Freud believed that the mind was attempting to compensate for the lack of a perfect father figure, and as a result, the development of an idealized father image emerged, which in turn became God. He goes on to say that religious ideas, which are given out as teachings, are illusions, fulfillments of the oldest, strongest, and most urgent wishes of mankind. The secret of their strength lies in the strength of these wishes." Now, this wish-fulfillment theory was easily countered by C.S. Lewis, who argued that the biblical worldview involves a great deal of despair and pain and is certainly not anything one would wish for. He argued that understanding this view begins with the realization that one is in deep trouble, that one has transgressed the moral law of God and needs forgiveness and reconciliation. The comfort of belief that Freud had clinged to for his explanation of God and the origin of religion as manifestations of our subconsciousness, could not be realized until after we experience the dismay of recognizing our sinful nature and our need to be reconciled with God. In essence, first comes dismay, then comes comfort, which is contrary to Freud's belief that comfort comes first in his theory for religion and Christian theism. The 19th century psychologist Carl G. Jung also attempted to explain away the origin of religion as manifestations of our subconsciousness that are also found in our nocturnal dreams, being nothing more than psychological symbolism and projection. Now, eventually, a broad consensus developed around the origin of religion, one that was more influenced by Darwinian evolution. This model had been termed the evolutionary approach in which religious scholar Dr. Winfrey Corduan explains the three theoretical assumptions were incorporated into this model. First of all, religion is seen as an aspect of human culture, which must be understandable without reference to actual supernatural powers. Secondly, religion began on a very primitive and childlike level, from which it evolved to greater and greater levels of complexity. And thirdly, religion as practiced among the least developed cultures in the world must be closest to the religion of early human beings. Now, before proceeding beyond this, 
Uh, it's the correct understanding of religion and culture is that religion determines the culture as opposed to the other way around, the culture determining the religion. It is the beliefs of the people that determine the values and therefore the behaviors in our culture. Now, based on the first assumption, it's clear that religion had already been dismissed as this all-encompassing worldview which manifests itself through culture. But nonetheless, this is the assumption that was embraced by the proponents of the evolutionary model and by various other secular humanists of our day. Now, according to the evolutionary approach, the origin and early development of religion begins from the lowest stage of simplicity and works its way up to higher levels of complexity, climbing what appears to be a never-ending ascension. Now, the lowest stage, which is believed to be the beginning stage for religion, is termed mana. The term mana is derived from the Melanesian tribes based on early studies conducted by anthropologists. Mana is the belief in an impersonal spiritual force in all of reality. Now, often accompanied with mana is magic, man's attempt to interact with the spiritual force. Now, magic can be better understood as a person needing to do the right action or the right set of actions in order to achieve the desired results. If you did the right uh, things or did the right things in successive order and you got the desired results, that's, that was magic. If you, did, if you did, didn't get the results you wanted, it was as a result you made a mistake in some form of your practice of these rituals. For example, perhaps a leaf needs to be bound by rope and burned in the fire for inclement weather to leave the region. And if it works, then the actions were done rightly. And if it doesn't, then the fault lies with the one practicing the magic. Now, the very nature of magic is mankind's attempt to manipulate and control the real world from the spiritual realm. You might be able to recall a more familiar and modern form of mana and magic, a, this form of paganism, in a recent incarnation that has broken box office records. In the original Star Wars trilogy... Yoda, the Jedi, teaches Luke Skywalker about the Force, and he says, My ally is the Force, and a powerful ally it is. Life feeds it, makes it grow, its energy surrounds us and binds us. You must feel the Force around you, you, me, the tree, the rock, yes, even between land and ship. Yoda, religious he is. Now, for a better... <laughs> For a better understanding of Star Wars and its underlying worldview of paganism, uh, you should check out the article Star Wars and the Ancient Religion by Peter Jones at our ministry website. Now, if we follow this evolutionary model for the origin of religion, the reasoning goes that as a culture develops, religion will supposedly develop from the stage of mana to the stage of animism, which some scholars have argued to be the beginning stage in the place of mana. Now, this development involves viewing spiritual forces as personal spirit beings. So you go from impersonal, uh, impersonal spiritual force to personal spirit beings, and in which animistic cultures split these beings into two categories, nature spirits and ancestor spirits. And it's in this stage that religious priesthoods emerge, such as shamans, witch doctors, and priests. From animism, we proceed to polytheism, in which a shift occurs where personal spirit beings who are deemed not superior to man uh, are elevated by worship to positions of godhood, making them incomparably superior to man. This is the meaning of polytheism. Poly meaning ma many, and theism, which means belief in God. Uh, therefore, poly polytheism means many gods or belief in many gods. Now, it's worth noting that certain features of animism, or say even magic, did, uh, did pass on to this third stage, supposedly. And the Romans were polytheists, as an example. They believed in various gods, but they also revered and prayed to their ancestors. A modern-day religion that best illustrates polytheism is Hinduism, which has not only grown in the West, but has also led to the development of New Ageism in the Americas. Now, what follows after polytheism is henotheism, which is all by similar, but also quite different. The Greeks, the Babylonians, the Egyptians were henotheists as opposed to polytheists. Henotheism is the belief in multiple gods, but it differs from the previous stage of polytheism in that particular towns or tribes will perform worship to only a select group of gods. For example, Troy could have worshipped the Greek god Apollos while still maintaining belief in the rest of the Greek pantheon. Or the Babylonians worshipping Marduk, they still acknowledged other gods such as those of Egypt, Canaan, and other regions. But henotheism implies that these gods only operated within their own geographic area or for particular people groups. 
This is why the biblical narrative of the Exodus was so significant, because for the Israelites being enslaved residents of Egypt, this meant that they were under the dominion of the gods of Egypt. And yet the plagues and miraculous deliverance of Israel demonstrated the powerlessness of not only the Egyptian idols, but of all idols of all nations, exhibiting the supremacy of God over all of creation. The fifth stage of religion's evolution was proposed to be monotheism, the belief in one God. They proposed Judaism, Zoroastrianism, Christianity, and Islam. And according to the evolutionary hypothesis, Dr. Cordion writes that monotheism was first attempted by the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten, who attempted to substitute for the previously held polytheism the exclusive worship of Aten, and that this attempt failed but became successful according to the evolutionary view among the Hebrews under Moses. But if you recall, I had mentioned that this was a never-ending ascension, or so it appears. Because monotheism is argued to be a stepping stone towards some future religion, and if there were to be a cap, secular humanism is advocated to be the highest possible religious development. Now, here lies the problem. This evolutionary scheme for the origin of religion has never been observed at any point in time in history. There is no record of a culture progressing through these successive stages, and there are many examples of cultures regressing into more primitive forms of religion. What we are left with is a a theoretical proposition that bears no historical validation and ultimately no reason to believe it's true. What we do have is an admission as to the presuppositions held by these scholars who have sought to discover the origin of religion. The anthropologist E. E. Evan Pritchard wrote the following. We should, I think, realize what was the intention of many of these scholars if we are to understand their theoretical constructions. They sought and found in primitive religions a weapon which could, they thought, be used with deadly effect against Christianity. If primitive religion could be explained away as an intellectual aberration, as a mirage induced by emotional stress or by its social function, it was implied that the higher religions could be discredited and disposed of in the same way. Their theories, their estimations, their hypothetical assumptions all failed to correspond with reality and were all at root attempting to dismiss Christianity, not Hinduism, not Buddhism, but particularly the only worldview that confronted the heart of man with the truth. Now, this discussion over the origin and development of religion was not void of believers who held to the authority of God's word. As the 20th century linguist Wilhelm Schmidt arrived on the scene with unashamedly Christian presuppositions. Now, he was a Roman Catholic priest who believed that Scripture provided the answer to the origin of religion. And being God's Word, he expected to find that reality reflected, uh, he, he expected to find that reality reflected the truth of Scripture. Now, his research put forward the biblical teaching of original monotheism, in which the beginnings of religion are found in God. This monotheistic belief is described as belief in a personal God, referred to with masculine grammar and with masculine qualities. His abiding place are the heavens, and he is infinitely superior to mankind in every form, including knowledge and power. He is the creator of all things, the moral lawgiver, and the judge who shall hold all men accountable for violations of his law. As to man's relationship with God, he is God's creation, subject to God and his reign, but due to disobedience and rebellion, man was separated from God, but by means of animal sacrifice, God provided the means for reconciliation. Now, what I just described to you was what Wilhelm Schmidt discovered in his extensive ethnological studies of the primitive cultures of his time. These primitive cultures holding to an original monotheistic faith were found in Africa, the Americas, Asia, Europe, Australia, and other various parts of the world, such as the African pygmies, the Native American tribes, the Australian aboriginals, and more. He discovered that the most ancient cultures featured exclusive worship of God in almost no magic or mana. Well, how then did cultures move away from monotheistic worship? Well, his studies helped to reveal that cultures fell away from this form of worship, experiencing what he termed decay and corruption. It could have progressed from monotheism to animism, or polytheism, polytheism, or henotheism, or various other directions depending upon each culture and people group. Now, if this seems familiar to you, it's because Schmidt expected to find the truth of the biblical narrative in his ethnological and historical data. 
The book of Genesis opens with the personal God creating the heavens and the earth. And it is upon creating man that we find the origin of religion and God, in which Adam and Eve both believed in God and their worldview was shaped according to their knowledge of God. When mankind sinned, he was cast from the garden and separated from God. But he was instructed on how to overcome this alienation by means of animal sacrifice for the atonement of their sin. And it foreshadowed, of course, Christ who would come in the New Testament. And as Genesis describes, the vast majority of the human population strayed from God. And even after the global catastrophic flood, the same corruption occurred, a falling away from worship of the true God. The confusion of languages at Babel and the scattering of people groups throughout the world also helps to explain the vestiges of original monotheism in cultures worldwide. Now the Apostle Paul helps to explain this falling away in Romans chapter 1, verse 20 to 25. And it reads, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood as through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, their thinking, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Every time cultures abandon worship, Of the one true God, whichever form of religion they transitioned into, whether animistic, polytheistic, or henotheistic, they always exhibited one thing in common. They all made man the center of its worldview. Now, there have been attempts by various cultures to reform their religion to an original monotheistic one. Zoroastrianism, for example, was heavily influenced by Judaism during the exile. And Islam was influenced by both Judaism and Christianity. But both retained man as the center of its worldview. And both were counterfeits of the true faith. As Dr. Corduan had put it, Wilhelm Schmidt believed that his conclusions not only paralleled the biblical narrative, but verified it from a scientific standpoint as well. Well, how did scholarship respond to his work? They first accused him of allowing his work to be influenced by his Christian presuppositions as opposed to taking a neutral approach towards the subject. They're saying, well, you obviously believe in the Bible and and obviously you're allowing that to influence your findings, your scholarship. Why can't you be neutral in your scholarship and try to see what else you might find, where, where it might lead you? But his critics were committing the same violation that they accused Smith to be committing. That is to say, they were also approaching the question of the origin of religion with naturalistic presuppositions. They had already eliminated the belief in God, the possibility of God. In other words, it was impossible to be neutral. As human beings, we all have beliefs that we bring to the table. And since that wasn't enough to dismiss his research, they suggested that his studies of primitive cultures were tainted by Christian and Muslim missionaries who influenced monotheism. Well, once that was shown to be false, the work of Wilhelm Schmidt helped to present Scripture as the truth that always was. The work of Wilhelm Schmidt helped to present Scripture as the truth that always was, leading to the vast community engaged in this discussion to abandon it for other fields of research. They had lost the battle. This is why the 20th century historian Joseph Kitagawa decided to sidestep the question of the origin of religion by answering, one must remember that the origin of religion is not a historical question. Ultimately, it is a metaphysical one. But in what way were these scholars self-defeating in their attempt to explain away religion? Religion can be defined as a personal set or institutionalized system of religious attitudes, beliefs, and practices, and as a cause, principle, or system of beliefs held to with ardor and faith. It can be better understood as a worldview, the lens by which we subconsciously view and understand the world, our perception of reality. It could be any ideology, philosophy, theology, movement that provides an overarching approach to understanding God, the world, and man's relationship to God and the world. Okay, well, what then of secular humanists who don't hold to a system of beliefs that exhibits supernaturalism? Well, they too have a set of beliefs. 
a worldview which answers four fundamental questions, origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. These, in turn, set up beliefs on theology, philosophy, ethics, biology, psychology, sociology, law, politics, economics, history, and more. Everyone, including the secular humanist, holds a belief in response to these questions, and it is these beliefs that constitute their worldview. Everything they perceive in the world world, every interaction that they have with reality, will be interpreted through their worldview lens. So a Christian, therefore, if he is faithful to Scripture, will interpret every event through the lens of Christianity. A secular humanist, if he is consistent, will interpret every event through the lens of naturalism, the belief that the material world is all that exists. A secular humanist is therefore religious because he holds to a system of beliefs that governs his understanding of the world. And the humanist manifesto is just as a, a, a religious a text as the Hindu Vedas and the Pali Canon of Buddhism. So attempting to explain away religion is self-defeating because some form of religious thought is employed in attempting to explain away religion to begin with. It is absolutely impossible to approach any matter from an irreligious perspective. Neutrality, in essence, is non-existent. Well, what then is the relationship between reason and religion? Man's reasoning will always be influenced by his systematic beliefs, his religion, and therefore reason is subject to religion. For example, the atheist will reason that morality is a social byproduct of human evolution. But his reasoning is influenced by his presuppositions, the beliefs he adheres to religiously that he already brings to the table. Another example, the Christian will reason that morality is rooted in God's being and that the moral law was given to men by God. First, and that we were created in God's image and hence have an understanding of what is good and evil. And second, that he revealed his law through his spoken word and his written word. His reasoning is guided by his belief in God's word, and hence his reason is subject to his faith. There is no such thing, then, as irreligious reasoning. Our reasoning is inseparable from our religion, our worldview. Well, what, then, is the nature of reason? Reason is defined as the power of the mind to think and understand in a logical way, logic being the analysis and appraisal of arguments. We use reason and logic to understand the world to analyze and appraise statements being made about reality and whether they correspond with reality or not. We find this in Scripture, such as Acts chapter 18, verse 4. And he reasoned, Paul, in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. Acts chapter 19, verse 8. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. You see, all logic must adhere to three fundamental laws of rational thought. The law of non-contradiction, which states that two or more contradictory statements cannot be true at the same time and in the same sense. The law of identity, which states that A is really A. In other words, each thing is the same with itself and different from another. And the law of the excluded middle, which states that any proposition is true or its negation is true. There is no in-between. So it's either true or it's false. There's no in-between. Logic then represents the principles of reason. And they are rooted in the very nature of God who is logically consistent. Now, we need to understand that we do not have our own logic or our own rules for reason and thought. We are using God's logic. We are using God's rules for reason and thought because we are His creations, we bear His image, and we are living in His created world. God, therefore, is not subject to our reason because he is the author of reason. And in creating us in his image, we are capable of reason because he is a rational being. The principles of reason then come from God's very nature. Well, if this is true, why don't we all agree with the Christian worldview? Why are there so many worldviews when the historical Adam first began with one worldview rooted in God? In essence, what I'm asking is, why is our reason limited from comprehending the full truth? Romans chapter 1, verse 18 reads, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Our fallen human nature, our sinful depravity, prevents us from seeing clearly by suppressing the truth of God. 
This is what Paul reiterates to the church in Ephesus. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 17 to 18. What Paul is referring to is not necessarily the non-Jew, but all those, including Jews, who do not have a saving relationship with God. He is saying that those who are not saved have a vain mind and a darkened understanding. Their efforts to think neutrally, that is to say, irreligiously, are characterized by intellectual futility and ignorance, stumbling the darkness. What happens when man is saved by God's redeeming grace is a lifting of the veils that kept us from seeing clearly, a turning away from the wisdom of men and an embrace of the mind of Christ which is gained by the illumination of the Holy Spirit. It is, as Dr. Greg Bonson had put it, the Christian walk does not honor the thought patterns of worldly wisdom but submits to the epistemic lordship of Christ, his authority in the area of thought and knowledge, And in this manner, a person comes to faith, and in this manner, the believer must continue to live and carry out his calling. Even St. Augustine, waiting on this matter of reason and faith, writing, The mysteries and secrets of the kingdom of God first seek for believing men, that they may make them understanding, for faith is understanding's step, and understanding is faith's attainment. In understanding the nature of reason and the impossibility of neutrality in human thought, how then is the Christian to engage with opposing worldviews? Now, there are various apologetic methodologies, but the most biblical method of giving a reason for the hope that is in us, in fact, the only biblical method, which uh, is an apologetic method called presuppositional apologetics. It's apologetic that applies to all of life as it concerns the Christian worldview. It doesn't matter what subject you might be discussing, whether sexuality, marriage, family, life, justice, or other matters. The full-orbed gospel is the good news of the kingdom of God that encompasses all of life. So in your conversation, if you want to biblically engage your neighbor, you need to positively present the truth and demonstrate the futility of the unbeliever's worldview, and not particularly in that order. Sometimes you might have to reverse that. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 4 provides us with wisdom as to how to reason with an unbeliever in which Solomon writes, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. What he does not mean is not to engage with a fool in conversation. He's not saying that. He's not saying don't speak to unbelievers. But rather what he does mean is don't engage with a fool on his own terms of reasoning. If you do, you will commit the same fallacies that the fool is committing, and your reasoning will be just as foolish as the fool. In other words, as a Christian, you cannot think like an atheist thinks to further your case for the gospel, because to think like an atheist is to think in darkness, according to the patterns of the world. And therefore, the gospel will be seen as foolishness according to the atheist reasoning. If you're going to present the gospel, you need to to do it from a Christian worldview, from a reasoning that is rooted biblically in the mind of Christ. But when you are demonstrating the futility of their worldview, that's when it's appropriate to temporarily stand upon the presuppositions of the unbeliever for the sake of argument. Not as a matter of being neutral to present the gospel, but rather to show the unbeliever the futility of his own worldview when you follow his principles consistently. This is what Solomon meant when he wrote Proverbs chapter 26, verse 5. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. To clarify... Your apologetic, your apologia, is not built upon the foundations of the unbeliever's reasoning, but rather on Scripture. Only then can you faithfully defend and advance the gospel. But to refute the unbeliever's reasoning, you must critique it from within the unbeliever's worldview to demonstrate its futility. Let's look at a few examples. The atheist who discusses the existence of God will claim that the universe is nothing more than a cold, chance-oriented, impersonal universe. As Carl Sagan said, the cosmos is all there is, all there was, and all there ever will be. But how does he hope to explain from a naturalistic worldview how his self-awareness came to be? How does he hope to explain how consciousness came to be by chance from non-consciousness? How can he explain how living organisms emerge from non-living materials? In this, you are not presenting the gospel as of yet. You are demonstrating how the naturalistic worldview fails to explain the origin of human consciousness. Once you show the atheist that his worldview fails to correspond with reality, you then have the opportunity to present the biblical worldview in in its place as the only worldview that corresponds with reality. So you would show from the scripture that the personal and sovereign God created the universe and created life and human consciousness. 
The atheist either continues to believe his chance-oriented worldview, or he abandons his atheism and turns to the Christian worldview. The secular humanist who is arguing for equality will agree with the Christian that all men and women are equal. That's what they're fighting for. That's what they're trying to push in today's agendas. But if he were to be consistent with his worldview, he would admit that Darwinian evolution does not provide the grounds for equality. Instead, Darwin's theory of evolution gave fuel to racism, from anti-Semitism to racial segregation, to the Holocaust as a Darwinian experiment, to people groups thinking themselves superior to other people groups. Evolution instead suggests that some are more evolved than others. In fact, it was Frederick Nietzsche who wrote that equality is a lie concocted by inferior people who arrange themselves in herds to overpower those who are naturally superior to them. The morality of equal rights is herd morality, and because it opposes the cultivation of superior individuals, it leads to the corruption of the human species. Now, one must logically think of whether secular humanism provides the grounds for human dignity, because its naturalistic framework only suggests that we're no different than any and all other forms of life, or even that of non-life. When we succeed to demonstrate that secular humanism fails to provide the grounds for equality and human dignity and instead undermines it, we can then present the Christian faith or the Christian worldview as the only worldview that provides the grounds for equality and human dignity, and God's creation of man in his image. The final example. Seeing that we are discussing the nature of reason and religion, let us consider the secular humanist response to reason. In a naturalistic worldview where the universe is the blind result of chance, there can be no laws, necessity, nor principles of logic. There can only be randomness. The consistency of naturalism requires a universe that is in constant flux and forever changing, in which laws are therefore useless. But rationality requires laws. Otherwise, how can we distinguish, categorize, classify, and organize thought and language? Essentially, the naturalistic worldview fails to provide the grounds for human reason. Perhaps the humanist might say, well, yes, but these are not pre-established laws, but rather in the chaos of our universe, man is the one who imposes order. We are the creators of law for rational thinking. Well, if this were true, we would have a problem with subjectivism, where one man's laws for rational thought are different than the other, which would invoke a contradiction or a violation of the law of non-contradiction. The other question that ought to be asked is, who is man that he could impose order on a chaotic universe when he's the result of a chaotic universe? Well, what does the third edition of the Humanist Manifesto state regarding epistemology, the attainment of knowledge? Knowledge of the world is derived by observation, experimentation, and rational analysis. But how did the humanist come about to knowing that knowledge is derived by observation? Did he observe this? Certainly not. Observation and experiment and empiricism cannot explain how a humanist came to know this. The humanist fails to explain rationality from his worldview. There are no grounds for rationality, no grounds for the principles of logic, but rather the biblical worldview does provide grounds for rationality. It does assert an orderly universe governed by laws, the result of a personal and sovereign God who created all things. Man is therefore rational because he is created in God's image, and the universe is intelligible because it was created by a rational and law-ordaining God. In essence, understanding then that man apart from God is sinful and that he is operating in darkness and reason and thought, the Christian must therefore demonstrate that the unbeliever's worldview is futile and untenable. And in its place, he must present the Christian worldview as the only worldview that corresponds to reality. See, there are no other competing worldviews that are lesser in its validity. It's not the, the best out of all these worldviews. We must adopt the same presupposition of Scripture that there is only one worldview that is valid and true, and that it's, it's what we find in God's Word. This is what makes Wilhelm Schmidt's work so significant, because in entering the fray of this discussion over the origin of religion, he demonstrated that as opposed to the theoretical propositions of his fellow scholars, his ethnological studies demonstrated human history as aligning with the biblical narrative. The biblical worldview is the only worldview that succeeds to make sense of the origin of religion, the only worldview that corresponds with reality and its history, not the naturalistic worldview of the humanist. In conclusion to my lecture, then, both reason and religion do not conflict with each other. Instead, we find that reason is subject to religion, for there is no such thing as irreligious rationality. 
And in many respects, the laws of reason that we all abide by are rooted in God's being. And therefore, what sinful man has done is borrow God's laws of reason to entertain a foreign worldview, which is otherwise incompatible and untenable. What the secular humanist quips is that Christianity has sidestepped reason, but what they fail to realize is that they are using the very laws of reason that are found exclusively in the biblical worldview. It was vain then for naturalists to posit an evolutionary beginning to religion in hopes of debunking Christianity, because in the end their pursuit was futile, self-defeating, and in the end God raised the man in Wilhelm Schmidt to affirm the truthfulness of the biblical narrative. Our task then as Christians engaging our neighbors is to demonstrate the futility of their worldview in relation to any subject matter of discussion and to present the biblical worldview as the only rational worldview there is. But in all this, and this is extremely important, these final words, we must remember the words of Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this message by the Cantaro Institute. Please feel free to share it with friends, but do not commercialize or alter this material without the express written consent of the Cantaro Institute.